Thank you all for coming. <clears throat> so first off, hello, my name is Nestor Tupufi Angara. I'm the Honor PC Retention Specialist and Advisor. Uh, this year's theme for the MLK Week is Fear, Falsehood, and Freedom. Where do we go from here? One of the best ways that I believe to address these issues is to change the narratives that come from fear, falsehood, into narratives about freedom. So I believe it's only appropriate that we bring in a master storyteller to show us the power of narratives. So on behalf of the MLK Committee, it is my honor and privilege to introduce our next speaker. He is a well-known storyteller who has shared his narratives with over 1,000 schools and institutions across Washington State and the U.S., speaking about the power of inclusion and empathy. He is also a TEDx speaker and has delivered over 1,000 keynotes and presentations on topics of counter-narratives, inclusions, and story-based strategy. He's also the founder and, di and director of the organization Storytellers for Change, an organization that believes in the power of narratives for positive social change. Today, he will be sharing his own personal journey based off his newest, newest upcoming book titled, You Are My Other Me, Reflections of a Storyteller for Change. He hopes to illustrate with his journey what Dr. King described on his letter from Birmingham as the inescapable network of mutuality that exists between human beings. Please join me in giving a warm Highline welcome to a social impact consultant, intellectual scholar, and professional storyteller, Luis Ortega. Thank you, Nestor, for that uh, wonderful introduction. I'm always a little bit embarrassed when I'm introduced, and oftentimes uh, I do a, quite a bit of speaking and storytelling across uh, Washington, primarily at schools and uh, across the country as well. And a lot of times when people ask me, it's like, hey, send us a bio or something we can read. I'm like, if you must, but usually what I prefer is no introductions, just here's Luis, and then you get to know me as I tell you my story, because I think that's the only way you can truly get to know someone. So, uh, first of all, uh, I'm deeply honored uh, to have the opportunity to be here at Highline. Uh, over the years, I've had an opportunity to, to visit the college uh, in numerous occasions, uh, primarily uh, to work with uh, groups of students uh, who are just interested in harnessing the power of their own narratives to advocate uh, for change in their communities. So thank you so much for hosting me and inviting me. I would really love to start by uh, introducing you to what has been a transformational concept uh, in my life and really what I've worked so hard over the last 11 years to practice in Lakesh. Uh, in Lakesh uh, is a timeless Mayan precept that very roughly translates to you are my other me. And in Lakesh, I believe in so many ways, uh, it speaks to the type of radical empathy that is so crucial to promote inclusion and equity. Uh, it's not the empathy that we've learned to uh, really in many ways absorb uh, within our traditional narratives in this country. I think the mainstream version of empathy in this nation uh, is more closely aligned with what I will call sympathy. I think the notion of stepping into somebody else's shoes uh, is a failed metaphor, really, for speaking what empathy is really about. Uh, I'm not asking you to step into my shoes. You will still see the world the way you have always seen it, even though you're inside my shoes. I'm asking you for one second to be my other me. That's immensely more challenging, uh, but it's also so much more worthy uh, of what we as human beings are capable of doing. In Lakesh also happens to be uh, the title of one of my favorite poems, a poem written by Luis Valdez. He's known as the founder of Chicano Theater, the founder of El Teatro Campesino, and he's also a renowned playwright. He wrote Sut Sut, for any of you who, who may be familiar uh, with the playwright. Um, and, and I wanna briefly uh, start today by uh, presenting to you this poem, In Lakesh. Tú eres mi otro yo, you are my other me. Si te hago daño a ti, if I do harm to you, me hago daño a mí mismo, I do harm to myself. Si te amo y respeto, if I love and respect you, me amo y respeto a mí mismo, I love and respect myself. In La Cache, you are my other me. So short and yet so powerful, and I remember the first time 
I ever came across the poem. And suddenly, uh, at that point, I had spent about seven years uh, as a storyteller uh, doing my work. And it was like as if the sum of seven years of storytelling just suddenly came crashing into me. And, and I began to truly understand in, in so many ways why I was doing what I was doing. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but sometimes you get so caught in a struggle uh, that you are just going day by day responding and reacting uh, to the urgencies that are right in front of you. And you still do it because you care and there's a, a deep value around it. But there's something about the urgency that also blinds you to this larger purpose that has been driving you all along. When I read that poem, I understood that's what I had been trying to do uh, for the last seven years. And now, 11 years later, uh, it continues to be at the center of my work. The poem also happens to be, uh, in, in, a, in a different way, uh, a metaphor for uh, my existence in this nation. Let me further explain. The poem uh, was used and has been used in, in so many different classrooms across the country, but I came to know about the poem when it was used by a group of maestros, a group of educators from Tucson uh, School District, where they began to use the poem as a way to educate their young students about their roots, about their culture and their backgrounds. Uh, they started a very prolific ethnic studies program. Uh, up to the point where uh, some of the students who uh, in the past uh, were well on their way out of their school system uh, suddenly did a complete uh, 180 turnaround. They were now on their pathway to graduate, in their pathway to college. They went, I believe, from a 56 graduation uh, percent uh, rate to almost 96 percent within four years. Uh, and it was mostly credited to this ethnic studies program. Within uh, two years of some of this success, uh, a different type of uh, reaction began to, to come out of uh, the district and overall the state. And suddenly, uh, the poem had been made illegal. It was banned. Uh, to this day, in fact, the poem cannot be read in a public school in Arizona. Uh, the maestro, since then, have uh, enlisted a, a group of activists and lawyers, and they're currently fighting it on the courts. Uh, but this is one of many other uh, literary works that were banned by state law, banned from being read. State officials going inside classrooms, taking it away from kids and saying, you cannot be that proud. I'm undocumented. And in so many ways, just as this poem uh, was made illegal, I've been made illegal uh, by things that are, uh, in many ways, outside of my control. In La Cache. Have you ever experienced a uh, connection, like a moment of deep connection? Uh, I don't know uh, what that may mean to you, uh, but I would love to illustrate what deep connection means to me. And it's kind of one of those things that uh, before you explain it and before you, you tell it, uh, you sort of have to experience it. So I'm going to invite all of us here to connect. Uh, and it's going to be in a very real way. Uh, this is going to require for all of us to move a little bit. Uh, it's an invitation, not a demand. So if you're like, no, this is, this is not the thing for me, uh, that's OK. I'm OK with that. Uh, challenge by choice. But I want to invite you to connect. And, and it's going to take a little bit of time, but trust me, it's going to be worth it. So here's what I'm going to ask us to do. Uh, right here, uh, I'm going to ask a, a couple of people, maybe eight of us, to make a circle. And then I'm going to ask a couple other people, it's going to be about 16, to make an outer circle. And then we're going to keep making outer circles until we're done. All right? And then we're going to engage in an exercise here real quick. All right? So I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. You don't need anything on your hands, no coffee, uh, no pens, no pencils, nothing. Let's just go ahead and... We'll make a small circle here first. Yeah, perfect. You guys, you are the first ones. Come on up, come on up, come on up. We can have a couple more people over here. And then let's start making a second outer circle here. Perfect, perfect, perfect. We still have space over here. Awesome, awesome. Awesome, awesome. 
Come on down, come on down. We're probably going to make another circle that's going to go through here. Perfect. A third circle. We have a third circle going on there. That's awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Hey, Tanya, how are you? So good to see you. And we're gonna, excuse me, brother. Uh, we are gonna have uh, one more circle here, so we're already on four circles. So another circle can start coming down this way. So everyone over here coming down, coming down. Perfect, we'll connect with these beautiful people over here. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And for those of you that are coming down there, we're gonna start one more circle over here. So let me move this out of your way. There's obstacles to connection in life, but we remove them. <laughs> Sorry, I am a storyteller, so I use metaphors in all kinds of ways. Move over, move over, move over, move over. Perfect, 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 perfect. Let's come on. There's still space for everyone. We'll adjust, we'll adjust, we'll adjust. All right, all right, all right. Okay, okay. So here's a, just the one thing that I need everyone to do a little bit. So everybody take up maybe like about half a step back. Okay, perfect. All right, we're expanding a little bit. All right, right on, right on. So here's what's really important for me, for all of you who, who are about to uh, engage in this exercise. Make sure that you have someone to your left and someone to your right. So go around, like, say hi to them. It's like, hey, what's up? Uh, introduce yourself real quick. All right. So here's what's going to happen now. I'm, I'm not going to give you instructions for now. I'm just going to ask you to do exactly as I do. Uh, just follow along, and it will all make sense soon. give you instructions this time. <laughs> Clap twice. Clap twice. Check them low. Check them high. Right hand up, pointing to the sky. Left hand to the side. Wiggle a little. OK, cool. And at the count of three, your right finger is going to land on somebody's left hand. One, two, three, two. All right. So your right finger should have landed on somebody's left hand. Connection takes practice. Connection takes practice. All right, let's try this one more time real quick. Clap twice. Clap twice. Check them low. Check them high. Right hand up. Left hand to the side. We got a little. And one, two, three, two. Sound effects, everybody. One, two, three. Okay, cool. So um, we are connected. And right now, really, uh, oh, please remain like that. Please remain connected. Uh, because this is just getting started. So in a moment, uh, I'm just going to walk you through, through a quick, uh, silly activity that I love doing. Uh, but the metaphor is powerful. Uh, I'm going to tell you a quick story. And every time you hear the word chili pepper in my story, you're going to have to try to do, I know, chili pepper. Uh, every time you, d you hear the word chili pepper in the story, you have to try to do two things at the same time. You have to try to capture somebody's finger and avoid being captured. All right? So you have to try to be doing two things very quickly at the same time. So, so we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to practice. So, finger should in her. So your, your finger on her hand. Right. Oh, yeah. There you go. Like that. All right. So, here I go. Are you ready? Okay, good. <laughs> All right. So, my name is Luis Ortega, and I'm a, I'm a professional storyteller, uh, born and raised in Mexico City. Immigrated to Seattle in 2001, two weeks after 9-11. And I want to tell you, <laughs> About, about the time I graduated from high school. So my mom, 
uh, she spent all her savings to buy this for me. And uh, I mean, I was so very touched. I was like, oh my God, mom, like, why did you do this? It was an airplane ticket to go to a place called Chicago. Uh, come on, people, there's not a place called Chili Pepper. I know, I know. All right, clap twice. Clap twice. Clap twice. Check them low. Check them high. Right hand up, left hand to the side. One, two, three, two. So, uh, anyone here been to Chicago? Anyone? Anyone? Chicago? Yes, I love, I love Chicago. Um, yeah. So the museums, amazing. The architecture, beautiful. Uh, I'm vegan now. Uh, back then I wasn't. So my favorite thing at the time about Chicago, the hot dogs. Oh my God, so good. So they put all kinds of yummy stuff on hot dogs over there. Fine, I'll tell you. Uh, tomatoes, onions. The bones have poppy seeds. Mustard, no ketchup, and chili peppers. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. I want to do this one last time, one last time. Uh, clap twice. Clap twice. Check them low. Check them high. Right hand up. Left hand to the side. One, two, three, two. All right, no. all right, all right. So I'm going to. I'm gonna try to trick you. I'm letting you know ahead of time, so just be ready. Championship round, okay? Chihuahua. No, I said Chihuahua. He's like, Chihuahua. Um, Chuchanga. No. Bananas. Nah, banana sounds nothing like chili pepper. I know. Um, clap twice. Clap twice. Uh, I, I just told you a story, and over the years, my argument has been that if I tell you a story and you truly listen to me, that's as connected as we can be. And it doesn't always quite happen, and I don't think so much is the fault of the storyteller, uh, if there could be any fault or blame uh, put anywhere. I think really what we haven't learned to do very well is a story listening. And, and I want to give you an example of what that should feel like because over my 28, nine years of life, I can tell you a handful of times when I felt truly really listened to. And it feels something like this. So everybody put your, your right, hand, right hand up. And then I want you to bring down your hand and touch the shoulder of the person in front of you. I, you have my arm. <laughs> you have my, my elbow, there you go. Uh, I don't know, you, you may be like, this is awkward. Um, it is a little bit awkward to be listened to because we're not used to being listened to. And suddenly you just feel the weight of people on your shoulders, but you realize it's not so much their weight, it is their compassion and their empathy that weighs heavy on you. I mean. I'm going to start crying here in a second because I can feel you. And it's, a, and it's a compelling thing to know that people see you and hear you and validate you. They don't have to agree with you. Uh, they don't even have to uh, fully understand you. Uh, but they feel you. And it's okay to not understand feelings sometimes. I think most of you would agree with that. But this is what being listened to feels like. This is what sharing a story and listening to a story should feel like. It's actual deep connection. Actual deep connection. It's a beautiful thing. I want to tell you about why 11 years ago I started uh, my journey as a storyteller for change. So I'm going to invite you all to take a seat and open your hearts to, to the story I'm about to share with all of you. So, in the fall of 2004, I had just made an appointment to uh, sit down with my high school counselor. And the last 
three and a half years of my life had been very challenging. I had left the country behind to find a new home in rainy Seattle. Uh, my family and I had overcome a, a number of challenges, one of them being homeless for some time. And despite all of that, I, I had done fairly well uh, academically. I knew college was the reason why my family and I came to this country. I knew my mother's sacrifice, uh, the only way I could ultimately uh, repay her would be with that uh, letter of acceptance to a university. I had my eyes set on the University of Washington. And in this fall of 2004, I, I was about to get a lot of answers that I needed. I had made an appointment with my counselor and I was there to ask about college and it should have been a, a simple conversation. It should have been just another meeting, right? Um, it was not. I, for the very first time, I disclosed to someone outside of my family that I was undocumented. And to be very honest with you, I did not say undocumented. I said illegal that day. And, and that's a critical important part to the story because there's very few times when I use that word, but I always do use the word when I speak of this time because I think one is important to understand for the context of the story that at the time I felt illegal, I believed I was illegal. And even though since then I've come to understand there's no such thing as an illegal human being, it is entirely possible to make people feel illegal. And there lies the difference. So I felt very much illegal. And perhaps that's why when my counselor in response to my plea for help and vulnerability as I disclose that my family and I were in fact undocumented in this country. Well, just, she, she stood up after hearing my disclosure, took three steps towards the door, opened it and said, get out. People like you don't go to college. I didn't listen. I, I, I didn't snap out of it right away. It did take me a handful of weeks and, uh, and a lot of hurt to get over it, but eventually I applied, I got accepted, I left my high school uh, where racial slurs and jokes about my accent uh, follow me every semester and I told myself never again I'm going back to school. I'm done with that. And I left and there I was, University of Washington, I was there to become a doctor. I am not a doctor. And that's where the story begins, really, because my very first quarter at the university, I received an invitation by a dear teacher, uh, the one teacher that I felt actually saw me, the only teacher of color I had throughout high school. And she was inviting me to go back to speak uh, to Roosevelt High School. Uh, she pleaded on her email, there is a group of students that just need a little more motivation, they're struggling. And I know you struggled when you were here, and you may just be uh, who they need to see and who they need to hear, just maybe. So please consider it, I invite you, uh, come out. My reaction was immediately, and, I, and this is what I mean with not understanding feelings sometimes, I felt anger. I felt anger. Uh, how dare you? Uh, well, first of all, why do you think you know I struggle? because I don't think you know me. I don't think you knew about what happened between me and my counselor. I don't think you knew about all the bullying that I had to put up with. I don't think you knew that outside of school, my, my family at some point, because one of my sisters felt very sick, uh, we spent all our savings, we lost our house, we lost our car, my mom lost her job, uh, just so that we could save her because we didn't have health care insurance. Uh, I don't think you know that my, one of my sisters and I had to sort of move around from home to home uh, just so that you could, so my mom could take care of my other sister and, and we had to endure all of that and you will still expect me every day to show up on time, ready to learn uh, and still perform. Uh, really? No matter. Uh, besides all of that, I don't do public speaking. Uh, and the reason is because when I was about uh, seven or eight years old, my mom uh, placed me uh, in this summer program where uh, the instructor was there to teach us a uh, indigenous song, I remember. 
And, and I'm going to sing it to all of you. Pardon, uh, my apologies. I'm not a very good singer. Um, so here it goes. Konesh, konesh, palechin. Chiburin, chiburin, atokin. Konesh, konesh, palechin. Chiburin, chiburin, atokin. It's a Majan lullaby, very ancient. Uh, so you, if you can just imagine for a second, I was about this height, a little bit chubbier, and I'm all the way in the back of the classroom, and all the little kids are like, Konesh, Konesh, Palachin, right? And I'm all the way in the back just going like this. <laughs> I, I was a shy kid. Uh, I still, in some, way, in some ways, shy. Uh, I'm introverted. That's really what it boils down to. And by the way, I think introverts make some of the very best public speakers out there, by the way. Uh, yes, power to the introverts. We, 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 can, we can talk more about that later. Um, so, so yeah, I don't do public speaking. And the reason is because after I was, uh, of course, my teacher noticed that I was back there not saying anything, invited me to the front of the class uh, to sing the song, and, like as if that was going to be an, an incentive. And I broke down crying. And, and that experience, just seeing my peers laughing at me, uh, seeing the, uh, the teacher just looking at me like awkwardly, like, what's wrong with you, kid? Uh, that just sort of generated a type of trauma. And my mom, uh, she had to leave work to come and get me. And she lost her job because she like, came to get me. So all of that combined just uh, really created this huge anxiety and fear of uh, public speaking and public singing, too. And, Throughout the next couple of years, I remember any time that I was put in front of my peers in a classroom, I would break down crying. Uh, my family and I moved a lot when I was little, so I went to about 13 different schools between the first grade and the eighth grade. And I was kind of happy about that because every time I would go to a new school, I was like, yes, nobody knows that I cry here. And then soon, like, something will happen, I will end up crying, and then... Uh, the, that nickname that has been haunting me since the third grade, La Llorona, would soon follow. And it's like the crybaby, but it doesn't quite describe it. There's like all this cultural connotation to it in Mexico, La Llorona. It's like legends and stuff, yeah. No legends about me, legends about La Llorona. Um, and I remember when I moved to this country, I made a very uh, a special promise with myself. I was like, you are not going to cry in high school. And... I don't know how many of you ever had to do some sort of public presentation in high school. Um, I never had to do one because I always negotiated my way out of them. And in one occasion, I, I think the extreme uh, of how far I was willing to go to not speak in front of uh, my peers was that I agreed to write a 45-page paper, uh, single space, instead of doing a 15-minute presentation. That explains how much I dreaded the idea of speaking in front of people. So yeah, of course, no matter that I'm angry at misfeeling, I just don't do public speaking. Um, I know uh, for a fact that as I was responding to this email, I started thinking a lot about my mom. And the reason why is because uh, I couldn't help it. Like, it just triggers some memories, right? Uh, like our first Christmas in this country where we slept in a basement and my mom would sleep in a corner and I would sleep in a corner and each one of my sisters would sleep in a corner. And uh, just uh, going through some of those traumas of being homeless and uh, seeing one of my little sisters uh, almost die, uh, those things just got me really thinking about my mom and how she had managed to get us through all of that. I want to talk to you all about moms for a quick second. So how many of you love your mom? Raise your hand. I love my mom. Yes, good. How many of you are also annoyed by your mom sometimes, be honest? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's, it's true. It's true. Uh, I want to tell you what's the most annoying thing about my mom. She's a really good person. And, and, and she's like, mm, I know what you mean. Yes. <laughs> she's a really good person. And, and the reason why that's annoying is because the most pressing question my mom has asked of me and my two younger sisters throughout our life is, what are you going to do for others? It's not even if you're going to do good or bad for it. It's just what are you going to do for others, right? And let that be good. Uh, and it's annoying because when you grow up with so little, well, what do you want me to do for others? Uh, if we had a little bit of extra food, no matter how little we had, we will give it to someone else who had less. Uh, if we had a little extra money or if my mom could find a way to go really out of our way to help somebody else, we would do it. And my mom never told us what we should do or not do. She just simply showed us what doing good for others looked like. Uh, over the years, 
you cannot help it. Uh, that sort of becomes part of who you are as a person. And that day, in that moment, for some reason, as I kept hearing my mom's voice in my head, like, what are you doing for others? I just felt that I had to show up at Roosevelt High School and have a final say about my experience there. And if I could give a little something, if I could pay forward a little something to a group of students that were having a hard time, then so be it. So I showed up, and I felt I was going to speak to maybe five, ten students. I found about a hundred of them. I thought I was going to have maybe 20 minutes. I was told I had an hour. Yeah, I was going to cry. <laughs> I, I, I remember I prepared this fancy PowerPoint with husky puppies and all kinds of motivational quotes. You can do it. Um, uh, si se puede. And, uh, I didn't make it past the first slide in my presentation. By the time the whole hour was done, all that had happened is I had just sweated a lot. I didn't cry. Uh, I had a very, like, just awkward looking group of kids looking at me like, please stop and take us back to class, somebody, somebody take us back to class. And they just finally kind of realized that it's over, so they don't know if they should clap or <laughs> Miss Feeling, my teacher, stands up and she's like, and I'm like, no, stop, that's making it worse and I'm even more embarrassed. Uh, they barely give me like a clap, like, have you heard like those like, kind of like lazy claps, like, g give me one right now? No, that was good. I'm not kidding, like it was, it was really bad. So I'm deeply embarrassed. I'm just asking this feeling, please leave, take the kids too. Uh, it's like, just leave me here uh, in my introverted world and I can just like roll up in a, uh, you know, little fussy ball and just like, you know, I, I need some time. So everybody leaves and I immediately relax. And obviously I'm embarrassed. Uh, my shirt's all wet, uh, it's a lot of sweat. Um, I will spare you the details. And I'm starting to pack up my things when out of the corner of my eye, I realize there is still one person that's, uh, that's here in the library. And all the way in the back, there's this kid that, I kid you not, is just doing this. Why did they leave me here with a weird kid? And I'm just like, so I'm packing all my things. Right? I'm not being very empathetic in this moment, right? So I'm just putting away my things, and I'm like, get out of here, not to self, tell the main office, we're kids in the library. <laughs> and I'm leaving, and now I'm a little concerned because I hear that weird kid is coming towards me. So I'm like, it's time to run. <laughs> and as I, I, I don't think I ran, you know, but I, I, I'm definitely like speed walking or something. And silly me decides to turn around one last time to sort of figure out, like, I just wanted to gauge how far away is this kid from me. <laughs> and I make eye contact with the weird kid. <laughs> weird kid looks determined. And he's just going at me, and at this point I'm like, oh, like I made eye contact with him. So now he knows that I know that I saw him. <laughs> and I'm hearing my mom's voice in my head, like, like, what are you doing for others? And like, you know, like, what are you doing for others? I'm like, oh, mom, why? All of this in one second, right? I'm just slowing things down for you. And finally, I'm like, fine, I'll talk to the weird kid. I turn around. I didn't even have a chance to say anything. Weird kid just throws himself at me, and he hugs me. And I'm like this. <laughs> What's going on? First of all, I feel really bad because, well, one, I, I mean, he's just getting drenched by my sweat. <laughs> and then I realized, like, like, this feels, why does it feel like more, wet? like, he's crying. I mean, he's just bawling, like, I've never heard somebody cry before. And I'm just like, I don't know what to do with this. I mean, I don't know if anybody saw us standing like this, like that. I don't know how long we stood there like that. All I know is that eventually it kind of hit me very slowly. Uh, my EQ, my emotional quotient at the time was not very great. It took me a while to realize that he wanted a hug. And even when I started hugging him, he was one of those horrible hugs like, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Shh, 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 shh. It's okay. It's fine. It's fine. And I suddenly, like, I started, like, hugging him more, and then we were just, like, fully on hugging. I began to feel that weight in my shoulders, and I'm like, what is it? Like, then I started crying. I was like, I don't know why I'm crying. He's like, why are you crying? Like, I don't know. Why are you? Like, I just cried there with this kid for, like, a good five minutes, like, just hugging and crying. We haven't even said a single thing to each other at this point. And, and suddenly... Uh, when he finally starts coming down, he just takes a step back. 
very slowly, he just looks up at me. His eyes are red. Uh, his nose is runny. Uh, and he just simply tells me, your story just changed my life. You're lying. I did not say that. But that's the first thought that came over to my head. Because when you've been conditioned to believe that you're an unworthy being, this uh, gets on your way of this, of connection. There's someone right there in front of you who's fully opening up themselves to you and telling you, you are worthy, I heard you. Like, this was amazing, you just changed my life. And my first reaction is to say, you're lying. Because I had been conditioned to believe the narrative I had told myself, the narrative I believe about myself was one where someone like me, that looked like me, that spoke like me, that had been through what I had been through, could not have a story that could make a difference. I had a deep lack of self-worth. And yet almost instantaneously as I rationalize, because whenever we don't want to feel something, we rationalize it. As soon as I began to rationalize, like, no, this is uh, your line, and obviously it was a horrible talk, I was overwhelmed uh, by a different feeling. One that I didn't understand until years later when I read that poem. You are my other me. And I love and I respect you. And I'm not going to hurt you if you tell me your story. And suddenly I realized, like, I am the weird kid. I've been the weird kid. All of us have been the weird kid until we find somebody else that doesn't see it as weirdness, but simply sees us as us. Humanizes us. I had been the other story my whole life, and then suddenly I became this story. We exchanged some few words. Uh, he left, I left. And I want to be very honest with you about this because I think this is one of the most powerful uh, takeaways from this story. I do not remember his name. I don't. As much as I've tried, like, I just cannot remember his name. I have not seen him since then. And the kicker is, like, he told me I changed his life. And I so wish I could find him to tell him, you are the one that changed my life. Just one person, just five minutes, forever changed the trajectory of my life. I did not see it then. I did not understand it then. It took me seven years to sit down with a poem in reflection to suddenly realize how powerful it can be if one person truly listens to you. 11 years of storytelling and all the wisdom that I have to give you is listen. In Dr. King's uh, letter from Birmingham jail, he speaks of an everlasting network of mutuality between human beings. Our destinies are all tied together. If justice anywhere is a trust is to justice everywhere, right? It's like, you may have been all the way out here, but if you're hurting, no matter if I'm in the center, no matter if I'm all the way over there, I feel you. There's no escaping it. There's no escaping it. There is ignoring it. There's hating it. There's fearing it. I, 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 I want to close because I know some of you have to get to class and, and, and I just, then we can open up to questions and, and maybe some more stories. But here's something else that, that I want to share about you from, from Dr. King's wisdom. And this comes before his letter to, uh, from Birmingham jail. This comes before his I Have a Dream speech. Uh, this is in 1962, October 12th. And he's in Mount Vernon, Iowa. To sp uh, he's there to speak at Cornell College. And as he closes his speech that day, uh, he says the following, that he's convinced that the reason why people hate each other, hate each other. Because we fear each other. We fear each other because we don't know each other. We don't know each other because we don't communicate with each other. And we don't know communicate with each other because we're separate from each other. And he was not speaking about segregation. 
At least I don't think so. He was speaking about the reality that you and I could just be a feet away from each other. We could be next to each other, and we could still be completely separate from each other. We could not communicate. We cannot listen. We can be strangers to each other. I will fear you, and I will hate you. And if you really think about what, what it takes to really close that separation, and this is what I've really spent 11 years doing this work, one is humanizing the story. In many ways, I felt whenever possible, it is my responsibility uh, to speak about uh, the plight of un undocumented people in, in this country. But it pretty quickly extends to uh, just unwanted people, right? I do not see my plight as an undocumented person, only as an immigrant plight. I see it as a plight of anyone who has ever been marginalized. Anyone who has ever been hated, fear, pushed aside, pushed away, demon worthy. And this is why for, for 11 years, uh, my work has not been just focused on immigrant rights or refugee rights. Uh, my work has really been about giving people two fundamental skills, storytelling and story listening. And I would argue that in today's world, these last two years have really challenged me. You know, I, 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 I travel all over, so I've, you know, I've been in places like Alabama and Louisiana and Kansas, uh, Nebraska, in rural areas. I tell them the same story I'm telling you right now. And I've been challenged. And I argue that in today's world, one of the most radical acts that we can engage on is to truly listen to each other, regardless of what the other person is saying. And that can be an easy thing to do, or it can be the most difficult thing that you'll ever do in your life. <coughs> but most importantly, never undermine the notion that just five minutes of listening to someone can change somebody else's life. And isn't that what we should all be pursuing? With that, thank you so much. I'll open it up to questions. Uh, and yeah, hi. Uh, as you travel the countries, what have you learned about security? Yeah, sure. So the question is, uh, through my, throughout my travels, is there anything that I've learned about empathy? Uh, and I think it's part of what I addressed at the beginning, that we actually don't know what empathy is. Uh, we confuse it as sympathy. Uh, most of my work happens in school districts across the country. And, and I can definitely tell you that if there is, uh, well, first of all, listening is the one skill that I wish all our teachers uh, had. Like we need like serious professional development around that. Uh, but listening is empathy. And for me, the biggest strength that I've come to understand is that there is just a tremendous misconception of what it is. Uh, they just we've lost the true definition of what it means. And I think especially for anyone that has uh, any form of privilege, I'm guilty of these in some ways, my, my male privilege, uh, you know, anyone that has any amount of privilege has really a lot of work to do. Beyond, and it's, again, it's not that step in somebody else's shoes. I don't want you in my shoes. Trust me, I mean, like, you're welcome to try my life on for one day, but that's not really what it is about. Uh, because you're still gonna bring your bias and your prejudice into my shoes, uh, into my community, right? I want you to sit down and listen. Um, some people are ready and willing to take on that, and for some people, as I said, it's a very radical ask. Uh, so, so that is uh, the, the one thing that I've taken away, that is the one thing that I'm trying to tackle and address on, on my book. And, uh, Really what I hope will be my mission for the next five years is just really to engage in these uh, challenging conversations around uh, listening. Yeah, question. Uh, ah. Yeah, yeah, 
so the question is, how did I get over uh, the fear and anxiety of speaking in public? The answer is I didn't. Uh, to this day, I still experience great amounts of anxiety uh, and fear whenever I speak in front of people. I think what I found that was uh, incredibly powerful is a reason to speak. Just as we have to find a reason to listen, uh, for me, in my own personal journey, uh, I really had to first uh, clearly articulate to myself why is it worth it for me to go through that fear, through that anxiety, and is there something greater than that? And that day, I was so fortunate that the first time I sort of opened up myself uh, to be vulnerable, there was someone in the receiving end who was willing to reward that vulnerability with validation. And in many ways, uh, if anyone here uh, fears public speaking, uh, and it's not so much public speaking really, it's the act of just storytelling and sharing, which can sometimes be even more vulnerable when you do it in front of somebody. Uh, to this day, I find it so much more difficult to share my story if I'm just sitting down at a table across somebody instead of doing this. This is safer for me, actually. Um, so, so no, I, I did not get over it, and, and I hope I never do, because there is this hunger that, that comes with this anxiety and this fear that really fuels my, my storytelling. I don't think my story uh, would be near as powerful if I, if I did not share all the emotion that I feel when I'm in front of you. And I think, if anything, the reason why I kept being invited back to schools, uh, because between my freshman and senior year in, 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 at the University of Washington, I traveled to 300 schools to speak as a volunteer at classrooms and conferences and party nights. Uh, I, I was not on this journey to be a paid speaker. Uh, that's not what happened. I was like, oh, there's a business model here. No. Uh, it's like, I, I saw a need and I was hungry for it. And the only way I could fulfill it is through this vulnerability. And I think students recognize that. I, I think students always know. And if you're real with them, they'll be willing to be real with you too. And that realness comes with my anxiety and my fear. It's me, I'm not gonna apologize for it, right? And I think if you ever fear anxiety or, or fear about something, don't apologize for it. Like, you have to own it, turn it around, and make it your strength, right? I spent so much of my life being told what were my weaknesses. And all along, my weaknesses is precisely who I was and where I was the strongest. I just had to change that narrative. Uh, it, it really is about just opening up Questions, other questions, thoughts? Yes, sir, you, you stood up with purpose there. Uh, I am Seth Davis, part of the Technology Discovery and the Mother Program. So, you spoke on listening being a powerful thing. I think, you know, everybody can agree speaking is also a powerful thing. So, as well as uh, connecting through listening, what would be the best way, what would be the first step into making that connection when you're speaking to somebody as well as them receiving? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, I think there, there is definitely this inner connection between the two, right? Uh, the storyteller is first and foremost a story listener. Uh, I don't always think that works backwards. I don't think the story listener will always be uh, a storyteller. Uh, at least that, that's my experience, and take this as uh, the view of Lewis's world, right? Uh, like, uh, we see the world as we are, not, not, not as it is, so just take, take it from that perspective. For context, you know, I'm someone who spent the first 18 years of his life very quiet uh, because of the introvertedness, uh, but also because of the stigma of being an undocumented immigrant in this country. You learn to stay quiet. And when I finally found that courage and vulnerability to speak up, it was incredibly important for me and, and, and so reaffirming, uh, right? Uh, but again, this took years for me to understand. I quickly realized that the reason why I became so good at storytelling and speaking to others is because I spent the first 18 years of my life just quiet and listening. And I think, you know, especially for those with privilege, those that will easily step into the role of speaking, right? They spend so much time of their life speaking, and that doesn't make you a good listener. That makes you a good speaker, right? So 
I think if, if you spent a good amount of time listening first and absorbing, if you've sat with your thoughts and reflection, I think that's the tool uh, that you need to be a great storyteller and a great story listener because you've already practiced listening. Uh, I don't think that works like necessarily, you know, it, it, it's, it's difficult the other way around. And it, and it is about privilege. Uh, it, it really is from my perspective. Um, you know, the, the other thing that I'll briefly say about this uh, before uh, just seeing if there's any other questions, uh, and I'm happy to engage on a longer conversation about this if you're interested because this is, this is my jam, this is what I love talking about, storytelling, story listening. But the last thing that I, that I will say about this is that I am particularly passionate about seeing people who will share their story uh, with a degree of uncomfort. Um, and, I, and I think those are really the stories that we have to open ourselves up to. If a story makes you feel uncomfortable, then dive in. Um, and that means, uh, in my context, that you are my other me is both the undocumented student that I speak with whose truth and story uh, makes me tremble because I cannot believe someone has been treated so inhumanely. And that will make me feel comfortable. And that person is my other me and I have to empathize with them. And the person that wants to deport me and that tells me, you do not belong in my country and I'm gonna drag you out of here. That person's also my other me. And I have to understand that they were not born like that. Not with that thought. Perhaps other unearned privileges. Yes, sure. They did have those, they did not choose them, but they have them. But the thought, I hate you, I fear you, they were not born with that. Judgment and bias is not a wrong thing. It's what we do with those things that matters. And I have to empathize with that person too. And I have to listen to them. And I have to try to understand them. And that pushes me. That's not an easy thing to do. To have a conversation with somebody that deeply believes uh, you are less than them and that you don't belong here. Uh, that's tough. That's tough. So sit with uncomfort. Uh, if you're not willing to do that, I doubt it you will ever have uh, the opportunity to feel what I felt when I was standing here in the middle with all of you on my shoulders. Uh, because it's the good and it's the bad, right? Uh, it's, uh, it's the optimism and, and pessimism. It's, it's, it's everything uh, together. Uh, it's, it's not simple. It's meant to be complex. And that's, I think, a beautiful thing. Welcome to my storyteller world. <laughs> Yes. So many questions I have for you. I, I, I hope that this doesn't in any way come off as a superficial one because I couldn't like straighten out how many things, teasing things I'd like to ask you. Um, they came to me to ask you about becoming a vegan. I, <laughs> I yeah, no, thank you. Ask. That's a great question. But sometimes I feel that that crosses over with, you know, maybe your, you know, the other me. I wondered if it, where it weaves in with your work and if you would like to. <coughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, very, very personal choice, very difficult choice. <laughs> um, it's not easy to be the one Mexican that shows up and is like, I don't need my carne asada. And it's like, I have hummus. It's like, you all seen that meme, right? Like the, the herbivore shows up the hummus and the T-Rex is like, we invited the herbivore, I'm the herbivore. And yeah, I, um, my mother, uh, again, I blame my mother. Uh, she's not vegan, but... <laughs> But from a very young age, she really taught us love for, for animals and nature. And uh, you reach a point in your life where you really start examining if your actions reflect what you say are your values. And they did them for me. And that felt kind of one of those things that I could kind of own and be like, nope, I'm, I'm going to be vegan. And it's kind of this one thing that I can control. And then it turned out to be great because during that time, I was homeless too. And I was in college. Uh, my family had gone back to Mexico. I stayed here by myself. And uh, that meant all my money had to go to pay for tuition and books. We didn't have uh, what we have nowadays, WASFAT, that helps undocumented students with some financial aid. We didn't have that back then when I was in college. So all my money would go to pay for tuition and books. And I had no money to pay for food and rent, so I spent two years homeless. And during those two years, uh, I learned to eat vegetables. <laughs> and eventually, I realized, being 
Viga is actually very budget friendly too. So a little bit of practicality and a little bit of values too, to be 100% honest about it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that was the vegan answer, everybody. <laughs> yeah, question. Yeah, please. This is kind of a question and a little bit of a story too. Um, fear, you brought up fear. And I think fear is used a lot to keep people in their places, to make me afraid of you, you know. And I was born in Mobile, Alabama. I'm old, I'm 61 years old. My dad, who of course is, um, would be in his 90s if he was still with us, in his 80s at one point in time. And he was a typical Mobile, Alabama, born and bred person, okay? And we moved to Florida, which brought in a whole Cuban thing too. But anyway, uh, <laughs> at one point when my dad was in his 80s, this makes me cry. He said, I don't know what we were so afraid of. And that, I think that's the question that when I try to listen to somebody, um, is to try to figure out why are you so afraid? Why do you believe the things you believe? And that's hard. Um, some friends that I protest for every Sunday from New New on the corner of Pack Highway and 320 the other way. And one day, this older gentleman showed up with his North America gradient cap. This was after the election. And it was difficult to just keep asking, how do you want me to feel that way? And he gave us some pretty interesting answers that were hard. But anyway, that that's what I, I Thank you. Yeah, and, and, and if I may just briefly respond on this question around fear. Um, so just yesterday, I, I was uh, at a nearby school district and helping them do some work around equity and inclusion by better listening to the stories of their students, go figure. Uh, but it's, it's one of those things that uh, is actually a lot difficult, a lot more, more difficult to do as a system than, than you would think. Um, and one of the teachers uh, was very excited to see me. We've known each other for some time and disclosed to me that currently a large amount of the teachers across the district are planning a day of action on January 31st where all of them want to wear a teacher that says Black Lives Matter. And uh, yeah, and I was like, that's, that's beautiful and that's amazing. And uh, in the back, uh, it has this larger statement about solidarity. And, and for them, it felt that same Black Lives Matter, uh, in fact, was a larger statement of solidarity that way extended beyond that. They felt like that was the issue to, to talk about and speak about, and, and I thought it was beautiful. And then, uh, as we were doing some classroom observations, afterwards, uh, she just told me, it's like, well, you know, I so I told you all of us, but reality is not all of us. There's a few of us uh, who, who have told us that they're going to wear their Ten Commandments t-shirt, their Right to Burst Arm t-shirt, their Make America Great t-shirt, uh, because they just don't agree with this. So it's not a lot of them, but there's a few of them. And, and, and she was angry, uh, really, really angry about it. And, and, and I sat with that for some time, and at the end of the day, I approached her again. And I said, I would love to talk to you about uh, you know, that anger that you, you talked me about, because I think, uh, sure, it, it looks like anger to me, and I can understand why. Because to you, it makes no sense how one of your friends and colleagues here uh, wants to bring this teacher in front of their kids who are mostly brown and black. Um, and I understand that anger. May I also say that it's fear? Uh, and, and, and can we talk about that? And, and can we understand his fear too? Now, uh, this is a huge ask, right? She's already looking at me like, what are you talking about? Like, do you want to empathize with this guy over here? Like, what about our kids? And I'm like, oh, I want to empathize with them too. You know, I, what I'm asking here is, if you approach this teacher and all you have is your fear as, as your argument and your anger as an argument, and I guarantee you that if this teacher is already having this type of reaction, all they have is their fear and their hate uh, as their argument, you're not going to get anywhere. And your kids are caught in the middle of that. Are you telling me that you expect your middle school kid to be the facilitator 
to help these teachers see. Uh, no, it's gonna be up to you, and that's a huge burden to carry, but it is gonna be you. It is gonna be you. What are we so afraid of? Each other, unfortunately. Because we don't see each other. Because we don't know each other. Again, like a colleague that she had had in this school for 10 years, and she did not know him. And now suddenly, this issue is making people feel like they have to stand on one side or the other. Uh, I don't think it's that simple. And, and there's no easy answers, and, and it's challenging, and, and I get it. I, I, I don't offer easy answers. I, I, I really offer what I think is a, a, a huge challenge. It's just be uncomfortable in that conversation and listen. Um, any other questions, any other thoughts? Yes, 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 sir, please. My name is Walter Heyman III. Uh, I'm also a part of the, <laughs> the Emotion Scholars Program. Um, you're talking about talking with others with privilege. And I just want to ask, how do you stay humble and open in a conversation where it's uncomfortable for you and you know that it's uncomfortable for the other person? How do you stay self-confident in having that conversation. Mm. Um, I don't think I stay self-confident. I stay worthy. And there's a, a bit of a difference there. Uh, uh, worthy. Uh, yes, I, I, I've reached a point in my life where I, I, this was definitely sort of one of those transformational moments uh, for me so when I was a, a junior at the University of Washington, I wrote a paper for one of my political science classes titled uh, Undocumented Citizen. And, and I didn't mean the US, I meant the world. Um, and that, uh, in, the, in that paper, I, I pretty much laid out my logic for why, uh, as an undocumented person of this world, uh, I was worthy as a human being. Um, uh, that process of writing and reflection and presenting that gave me a, a sense of self-worth that I believe has been challenged many times, but, and it has been tested and it has endured. So when I engage on, on difficult dialogues and conversations, uh, my confidence sometimes is shaken because uh, sometimes I am faced with arguments that uh, in, in so many ways are, 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 I, I just really don't get them. Uh, and, and that scares me, right? What you don't understand and what you don't know scares you. Uh, and it is scary to see sometimes how much of that is out there. And sometimes I'm, I've also engaged with some people who, uh, you know, are academics and they speak policy or they, they are experts on, uh, on other domains that I don't really fully understand. And, and that shakes my confidence too. Um, but my worthiness, uh, it's, it's there. And my worthiness gives me, uh, I think, two things. Uh, and one of them you mentioned, which is humility. Uh, to believe you are worthy does not mean uh, that you believe you are better than anybody else, right? Uh, it's actually quite the opposite. I think uh, to have a sense of worthiness, right, uh, gives you, at the end of the day, uh, a sense of balance and harmony, right? Uh, because for me, uh, what it does is that as I'm sitting in front of somebody else, I, it's not that I see an equal uh, so much as I see another human being. And it is this inner connection that at the end of the day, I can walk away from any conversation and say, you, you may deeply believe that, uh, that you are better than me or that, uh, you, uh, that, that I should be kicked out of this country. Uh, but at the end of the day, like, I, just, I, I don't think that we can ignore the fact that our futures are tied together. If you don't see it, then that's where my empathy kicks in. It's not pity, I'm like, and I'm sorry. Like, I, I just wanna feel, I, I wish you could feel that, right? And, and, and at the end of the day, it's just that connection, right? It's that harmony that I feel. So, uh, that's humbling. Uh, I think, you know, from, from a perspective of leadership, uh, the most uh, 
inspiring leaders, in my opinion, are those that have this humility about them. Um, because they will not lead uh, as, you know, uh, the figurehead at the front, but in harmony with everyone else, feeling everyone else, uh, understanding everyone else. Um, and you cannot help but to be brought down uh, to your knees. And I know that sometimes it's like a sign of defeat, but uh, don't take it that way here. Like you cannot help but to be brought down to your knees in awe at what it feels like to be connected to other people, right? I think Dr. King was that type of leader. I don't think you can speak and, and, and mobilize people the way he did without that. He was in awe at people uh, and their willingness to sacrifice and, and serve. Um, and he lived that message. Um, so, so I would say yes, uh, that's, that's my response to that. Um, I try to practice it. I fail many times at it uh, because uh, it's always nice and easy when you're speaking to an audience to put this in words and say, oh, wow. It's like, no, I, I suck sometimes. I'm terrible sometimes at this. Uh, I, I sit down with my sister who's visiting from Mexico right now uh, and I just, where, where, where is she? Did she leave? Oh, she's over there. That's my sister, by the way. She's visiting from Mexico. Um, and I sit down with her and we bend. And we say some ugly things sometimes. I'm not telling you that, uh, don't shy away from those things either. Like, right, it's not live your every single day as a worthy, perfect being. No, live every day as a human being and realize that part of that imperfection is going to be that sometimes you're not going to be willing to listen. Understand that and get over it, right? right? Rest up when you can, when you have those people that know can hear you, that can understand those frustrations, bent off, but then get ready for the next encounter where you will have to practice with so much humility, right? And with so much compassion, the act of giving to a person that's so willing and ready to take away from you. That's, that's tough. Right, but I, I cannot help but to feel so strongly that uh, that's the pathway forward, uh, at least for me, at least for me. <laughs> any, any last, any, anything else, anything else? Yes, sir. Um, you know, I would like to ask you Yeah, that, that one's a challenging one. So our, uh, who still is our president at the, at the moment, uh, addressed some of that on his last uh, public address. I don't know how many of you saw President Obama's last public address, but uh, it made me cry. I thought it was, uh, I thought it was worthy of the office. Let's just put it that way. And, and he addressed some of that uh, in, in some ways on, on, on his speech. And, and I'll defer to some of his words. Uh, one that as much as, especially for those of us that are tech savvy, as much as we like to preach uh, connection and uh, we're bringing the, clo the world closer together and uh, you know, social media, we can disseminate news everywhere and information and what a wonderful thing. Um, there's obviously uh, in so many ways, I think, uh, also some dangers about uh, this. I think in so many ways actually it drives this connection instead of connection. Um, I, I don't know uh, at what point we started thinking that poking somebody on Facebook was the best way to connect with them uh, <laughs> or retweeting them. Uh, like there's, there's something about that that concerns me uh, from a humanity perspective. Um, I, I, I think, uh, and I, again, I'm guilty of this. I mean, <laughs> I, I use social media all the time. Um, and the thing is, like, can we just differentiate the, 
social media has been a tool, I just would really love for us to use a different word that's not connection <laughs> when it comes to like social media. Um, just because I, I think it's just a very gross misrepresentation of what human connection should be. Uh, I, I believe, you know, what President Obama says is like, just sit down with that person and talk to them, right? Uh, don't, don't go back and forth arguing on post or on Facebook, just sit down with them and have a conversation with them. Um, I don't know if you should do that with everyone that's pursuing you <laughs> on social media. Uh, you know, uh, there's definitely some people that have said some things to me in social media that I don't think I would go uh, very safe <laughs> necessarily sitting in front of them at a coffee shop and talking with them. But I think that's not the point. I think the point is uh, the toughest conversations you're going to have are not going to be over social media. Uh, they're going to be with other people who are going to be right in front of you. So. Um, just be mindful of, of the silos that you're creating for yourself. And it's been difficult to not unfriend some people. <laughs> but I, this is, this is, I, I do challenge myself this way. I, I have not unfriended one single person. I've been unfriended, but I have not unfriended a single person just because of one post. Uh, if we sum up a, a person's character in just one Facebook post, or in 140 characters or less, uh, I think, there's, I think there's an issue there. Uh, as, as gross and horrible some of these comments may be, uh, and I know not everybody agrees with me on this. I get a lot of pushback on this. I get a lot of pushback on my message around empathy uh, from both sides, if you will. Uh, and there's more than two sides, but just from across the political spectrum, uh, I get a lot of people who tell me like, nope, it should never be on us to empathize with nobody. Uh, because we are the ones who have struggled and we're the ones who have been marginalized and uh, let's just get people to first acknowledge their privilege and then we can have a conversation of empathy way later on. And then I have a lot of other people over there who are like, uh, no, uh, where's my gun? And like, it's just, I mean, it's just that extreme. I'm just telling you that I get a lot of pushback on this. And, uh, and I think social media uh, and what we do to ourselves as we self-select who surrounds us uh, and who doesn't, um, <coughs> just uh, amplifies the problem in, in some ways. So uh, if you just surround with people that are willing to confirm your every thought, belief, and emotion, um, then I'm sorry because you're gonna live in a very small world.